Welcome to the home of the Seriously Social podcast. The world of social media is ever-changing and at a more rapid pace than ever before. Each episode, Socially and Partners, my partner, Coastal Cacadia, myself, Lorenzo Johnson, we take a deep dive into the world of social media. We try and provide insights into social trends, techniques, upcoming shifts in the market. With over 20 years of industry experience, combined with surprise guest interviews with leading experts in social media, the listener gets a behind the scenes look at how some of the biggest brands in the world market their company. So let's dive in. Awesome. How are you doing today, Lorenzo? It's a good Man. March 28th, Tuesday. Brother, I'm doing good. It's a beautiful sunny day over here in LA. Um, so I can't complain. Can't complain at all. How are you doing over there? Doing good over here in the East Coast and the A. So East Coast, yep. West Coast going on here. I like it. You looking sharp today. I, I should have I should have worn my blazer today. I, I didn't know that's what we was doing today. Nah, nah. We had a good day. You know, we were getting some more content out there for um, you know, the audience, um, starting to talk a little bit more about, you know, what social media is headed. So um, we're going to share a little bit of that on the episode today as well. But for those that are not following us on all of our social media handles, definitely take a look. Um, this podcast itself will be on YouTube and all of the you know regular mediums, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, et cetera. But definitely encourage you all to be following um, Social Ian um, to kind of stay up to date with what the world's greatest and latest brands are doing when it comes to the realm of social. We have a jam-packed um, episode today. There's a few different topics that we want to cover from Elon Musk to chat GPT and AI to, you know, layoffs and the work culture. So we're going to dive right into it. And I think we're going to go ahead and start off. I think we're a little bit behind um, the norm, Lorenzo, but I did not want to miss a chance for us to talk about Twitter and Elon Musk and all of the things that are happening in that realm. And I know a lot of, lot of people have started to pull back from Twitter and you know, really nobody, I can honestly probably say nobody really, really knows what's going on. So I know it's a little bit scary, um, but I'd love to, you know, go ahead and pose the question of, you know, what are your thoughts? How have you felt? You know, it's been a few months now since Elon's really took over. He has stepped down as CEO, but what are your thoughts? How are you feeling about Twitter? What are you looking at? What should, you know, people and brands be aware of if they are thinking about Twitter as part of their strategy? So obviously one of the things that we're saying is, um, I guess, skepticism from brands, especially larger brands, as far as, you know, is Twitter a place to continue to put your money in, um, to continue to invest your ad dollars in? Um, it, it's becoming a different platform. I'll tell you that. Um, it's becoming, uh, for lack of a more PC term, um, it's never been the prof most professional space, but it, 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 it's, it's becoming a space where my feed and different things are just being flooded with all types of content, spam, just a lot of things personally. And I know that's just making a lot of people uncomfortable, the types of content. Um, you know, I, I've talked to brands where that's another big concern that they've had is what's what happens when their brand starts getting put next to, I'll just say, um, not, not the most ideal types of content, for lack of a better term. Um, and do they ever want their brand to be associated with that type of stuff, especially if there's not going to be mechanisms in place uh, to, to limit that type of stuff? So those are some of the immediate concerns that, that when I think about what's going on with Twitter. And then the second one that I, I definitely want to hear your thoughts about is the impact that their paid verification is having on other platforms. Um, I'm glad you're hitting on that. Yeah, I, I wasn't the biggest fan of that. Um you know, a lot of people worked hard to get that verification, um, that validation. Uh, it, it also, there is a credibility aspect to it before that I think that all platforms are now struggling with. When you talk about chat GPT, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, the fact that I can just pay now for a verification. Um, mm -hmm. Who is the expert? How do you cut through the noise of who truly is the expert, who truly is the influencer, who truly is somebody to be followed? So those are two things that I see that, uh, that brands are kind of experiencing and that when I first think of Twitter and what's going on as of late, it causes for concern, for lack of a better term. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? So, And, you know, it is a unique perspective because I'm also interested to see, you know, kind of how it transpires. But let me at least, you know, spit some facts before we start to um, 
hypothesize essentially, you know, what the world of Twitter is coming into. So, you know, since okay. Elon took over and when he first did, you know, he definitely announced that there was going to be this paid subscription. Um, I believe Twitter Blue is now about eight or nine dollars a month for users to yep. get verified. I believe it was either today or yesterday, actually, Elon was um, giving some updates about it. And he mentioned that in order for your content to be seen on the recommendations page, you would have to be somebody who is subscribed to Twitter Blue and is an actual verified account. Um, the reason he mentioned that he was doing this is because he really wants to get away from the bots and the spam and the you know impersonations that are really happening on Twitter that people have become frequent to. He did still mention that there are going to be ways where certain bots can get verified as well, but that bot cannot be impersonating an actual human being or um, it can't be something that's, you know, spammy or not authentic to the platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to be interested to see how he really does that, because the whole purpose of what he was advocating for was with this new verification style which is interesting because, you know, I heard your perspective and that's why I'm interested to see it. But he is um, thinking that this new verification style and the plans that he has for Twitter will make it probably the only platform where misinformation and fake news, so to say, won't live, um, which is interesting because now, you, like you mentioned, you know, going back to me, just a regular guy, maybe on the street or anybody that can go in and, you know, pay the $8 a month, I'm now verified and have incentivization to why my content gets seen and how Elon and Twitter plan on combating that when it comes to, you know, the fakes and fake news and, you know, what people miss information. Um, I'm also interested to see, you know, what's going to kind of transpire. I don't want to say I can predict the future and really um, understand what may happen, but I, in my gut, I do have a feeling that Twitter is becoming a place where, you're starting to gonna see these like mini cults, so to say, which they technically have now, but I think it's gonna be even stronger than before around specific topics like sports and web three and crypto. And there's many other, um, I would say pop culture relevancy that Twitter has, but I believe it's gonna create smaller communities, more authentic, more real. Um, I do believe this also levels the playing field for the new change of TikTok, sorry, not TikTok, Twitter content, um, because everything is switching to what people want to consume, not just if you have a mass following. I think Twitter became a place where mass followers really were getting the exposure and not so much as the little people. Um, so it's really going to be dependent on the content, like a lot of the other algorithms have switched to. At least that's what I'm thinking. So, so it's interesting. You talk about some of the pros, but and now I feel like I'm coming off as being super pessimistic about it. But <laughs> the, the cons and the other side to that, though, is that I think it's impossible for those two things to exist. And then what I mean by that, that is Real. true freedom of speech and then limiting misinformation. Those things don't true. go hand in hand. If you're truly going to allow people to say whatever, whenever, however, in my opinion, it's literally practically impossible to then say that all information will be valid, will be truth and different things like that. Those, those two mm -hmm. things cannot exist in my opinion in the same space. Yeah. And that, you know, you bring up actually a very good point because ironically, when I was reading that post from Elon and I was going through the comments, it's something I do to just get more information when I'm educating myself and that exact topic was being brought up. It's like, Hey, you know, what about the freedom of speech? What about people just being able to say anything? That's really what you wanted Twitter to do. And unfortunately, Elon didn't respond. So I can't read his mind. So I really <laughs> don't know what, what he's thinking um, as far as it goes to that. But I think you hit it on the hammer right there, which is you're right. How does his vision of a place without misinformation or fake news or just spam kind of, you know, taking over at that same time relate to, you know, freedom of speech and being able to talk about anything and everything that may be important to us as human beings. So it's going to be interesting. Um, Twitter is going to be fun to watch. I do know from the brand side and specifically if you're a marketer, because a lot of big brands pulled away from mm -hmm. Twitter. I don't know for the future, you know, what may happen. We'll continue to watch the ad platform. But I personally do believe right now is a great time to be using Twitter ads because um, the attention is there and the supply has started to shift and pull away if it already hasn't pulled away. So just my two cents on brands or marketers out there that may be trying to take advantage, maybe a short um, shelf life um, as far as Twitter ads go. We'll see. Maybe not. 
but I do know in the immediate, if you take advantage of it, there's opportunity. So definitely encouraging the clients that we work with and, you know, many other businesses out there to at least explore it. Well, I'll throw a question for you then. If, if I'm an advertiser and I do want to put some money out there and I do want to invest in that platform with Elon not answering explicitly some of the questions about the amount of bots and the percentage of those things out there. Again, I know we've talked about bots in regards to verified check marks, but now we're talking about bots as far as just the average profile when I'm trying to target. Right. How would you respond to a client who basically says, I have concerns that are my ad dollars even touching real people? Yeah, that's actually a very real, you know, really good question, actually. And I believe, you know, we ran across that in the agency in the past as well, because that's honestly the real thing with all of the social platforms, right? Every one of these platforms have bots. Every one of these platforms have fake accounts. Um, the reality of it comes down to, and I really want to try to make this simple so it hits on the hammer for a lot of people. Underpriced attention at scale is the name of social. And, you know, social is here yes, to sir. stay for obviously the next five to 10, 15 years. We'll see how it continues to evolve as, you know, Web3 continues to grow. But the thing that's been important for me um, as of late, and, you know, I, I do actually want to talk about this as we continue to explore some of the other relevant platforms. But Twitter, even though there's nothing I can say or nothing any marketer can say, and if they do tell you like, hey, I can make sure you're not touching any bots flat out telling you that they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. There's almost zero control that we have on the what's available to us and the tools that we'll utilize that allow us to filter out the bots. So my question or where I would turn the question around back at them is like, are you really just worried about the bots or are you looking for underpriced brand awareness exposure? And if you are, my thought process is you need to be utilizing Twitter ads because like I was saying, the brands, a lot of businesses, many people because of the controversial state of Twitter have pulled away. So you're getting a much better bang for your buck. Let's yeah. say you get in front of 5,000 people. Sure, maybe 15% of them may be bought, but 85% weren't. So it's up to us to analyze the data at the end of the day, go back to seeing what's happening. And the platforms are getting better at showing what's an authentic metric versus a bot metric. So we can always filter the bot metric out and try to do you know, try to improve those ads to get in front of actual human beings. But I wouldn't say there's anything out there to completely get rid of it. I mean, this even goes back to Google search and the days of where fake clicks were a real thing or bot clicks were a real thing, and they still are. So I don't think people have to be afraid. They need to embrace it and figure out what they can do with the data that actually matters, in my opinion. Good stuff. That's definitely good stuff. Like it. We're going to see. I mean, awesome. the one thing that we know is they're going to continue to uh, evolve. Uh, they're, they're not going anywhere, sure. you know, for, for people who start to make those type of comments, Twitter isn't going anywhere. Um, it's going to evolve. It's going to address a lot of the concerns that we've talked about. Um, will it be perfect? No, but I mean, as we'll start to talk in one of our next segments right here, no social media platform yes. is perfect. <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, this is just a fun fact for people because I know, I don't know if Elon's feeling it, but I know people always love to give Elon a hard time, but he has lost about $20 billion since his Twitter acquisition, which it's not only him, you know, a lot of the market in general is, you know, teeter tottering, so to say. So um, I am a believer. I know you're a believer long term and, you know, being in the space of social, we are true advocates that we do believe Twitter has potential in the future. And 100%. I'm going to do like most things when it comes to Elon is, you know, fold my hands and just ignore what he's doing because in the past he's made it work and he's done a good job. And, I have faith that, you know, he's going to do the same thing. Now, do I question a lot of his tactics and the ways he does it? Sure. Um, but when it comes to being a true entrepreneur and thinking about the greater good in that sense, um, I have nothing but good things to think about him. But his tactics are controversial, and that's, that'll be a topic for another day. <laughs> 100%. 100 Awesome. So I want to segue, and I know we're um, continuing to talk about you know, these different platforms and speaking of platforms, why not go ahead and hit it on the um, hammer with the potential looming TikTok ban um, that the whole country honestly is talking about from congressmen to your daughters, to the mothers, to business owners, pretty much everybody is on the horizon with what's happening with TikTok. I mean, I don't know if a lot of you have been watching the actual um, cases or the actual interviews um, on, the, mm -hmm. on TV. Um, but it's been pretty fascinating um, 
seeing the CEO of TikTok getting grilled by our congressmen and congresswomen? It's, well, first off, it's comical. So we can start on the, the, the funny part about it. <laughs> um, the questions these guys ask, you know, you, you would have thought they would have learned from when they put Zuckerberg on trial. Um, the, the questions that right. they ask are are just so asinine, for lack of a better term. And it's also, it's one of those things that as you watch it, you're like, they're not even talking about the real things, the real problems, the real issues, because they're asking some of these other things. But that's always just funny just to watch what they ask and you, it, not to get off Literally. into that whole space, but it's just like, um, did the job, it's almost like, did y'all prep for this? <laughs> or did y'all just show up been... here and be told that y'all were talking to somebody from TikTok and just start shooting from the hip? <laughs> That's a hundred percent. The funny <laughs> meme that's been going on that I've been seeing is the um, people grilling the CEO of um, TikTok, and literally later that same day, um, AOC is posting a TikTok video about <laughs> about um, you know why she doesn't believe it should be banned and this and that. And the funny part is, it's like they're having a whole Congress meeting about all of these people wanting to ban TikTok, and then somebody in Congress, right after all of that is going on to TikTok. <laughs> It. So it's just funny and I get it and I understand the reasoning why like when you really start to take a deep look at the state of affairs and the government and the federal regulations that they're worried about um, and the data privacy and all of that so I do understand their concerns but um, also at the end of the day um, what most of us are worried about is the place where people have started to become popular where they're popping off the pop culture the creative of um, TikTok all of these things that us I would say people that are not as in tune with the government care about and you know what's going to happen if for whatever reason biden and the presidency and um, congress do decide that it's no longer going to be a platform that people in the states are going to be able to use so on that topic of you know TikTok getting banned what are your personal thoughts um as far as you know do you think it should be banned do you not or do you like to use the platform itself what are your thoughts so I think a few things. I think that concerns are valid. Well, at least the ones that they're putting out there. Obviously, as we know, when it comes to passing laws and things, there's all types of other stuff that I'll put out there. My issue isn't that the concerns aren't valid. My issues are that the steps taken to address those concerns seem mm -hmm. to be quite drastic, in my opinion. Um, there sure. seems to be like we're almost missing some middle ground and some middle steps that can be taken to address the mm -hmm. concerns and then leave the platform alone. Um, so that's kind of my first initial thought when I think about it. Um, it's 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 crazy how much people are using it. I mean, let, let's talk about how you're talking about a platform that uh, for a few weeks surpassed the amount of Google searches at one point in time. Just mm -hmm. literally just think about that. Uh, the, the, just think about that. The fact that something that we open up on our computers and it's there Google. and it literally surpassed Google at one point. That's crazy. A platform who needs so much content and this will kind of get into another thought that i have of it it needs so much content that it's talking about you know the algorithm saying three to upwards of four times posting a day because okay. it can't keep enough content on it now again this goes back to my other initial thought about are there some improvements to the platform to address some concerns that i think can be made yes um i do find it interesting that some of the research i've been showing talks about how uh tiktok is a different platform in china Mm -hmm. for example, and how there are certain limitations, everything from the amount of times that you or the amount of uh, limitations that a child can actually be on TikTok, the actual mm -hmm. content that served on TikTok. You know, one of the things that we love about it, one of the things that our advertisers love about it is, you know, when you talk about that scroll, you talk about ads and things being so interrupted. TikTok has literally figured that game out. TikTok has figured out a way where it's so seamless that next thing you know, you look up and you have been on TikTok for 45 minutes and you have no concept whether you've been looking at ads, looking at organic, looking at whatever you've been looking at. You just right. know that you just went down another TikTok rabbit hole. Um, so that's kind of one thing that I do think is interesting, again, and why I think mm -hmm. that are there some improvements that can be made? Um, it's addicting. Um, I, I'm not personally as addicted to it as I hear other people, but, you know, my fiance sits right next to me. It'll be mm -hmm. dead quiet for a little bit. And I'll be like, what are you doing? And she'll be like, oh my goodness, I went down a TikTok rabbit hole. And you're talking about dead Literally. silent, dead silent for an hour straight, just on her phone, just doing it. She's not a very aggressive social media person. I've never seen her do stuff like that on Instagram. Never seen her do stuff like that on Facebook and different things. So this platform does have something to it algorithmically. 
which again, I do love from an advertiser's perspective. I do love from a social media marketer's perspective. Um, it gets results. It gets engagement. Um, it can take a personal brand. Like you were mentioning, you know, some of the benefits on Twitter uh, that Elon is trying to do that TikTok has done. TikTok has allowed Lorenzo and Kosho to go viral if we really want to. 100%. And this is without using socially in. You know, if you do have tools and different things like a company behind you, you could do that even quick and stuff like that. So those are some of my initial concerns and thoughts. But as far as just outright banning it, banning it, my first immediate thought is that's a that's a quite a drastic step for the problems that we're talking about. And my immediate thing is, are there some other things that can be done to address those um, that that don't get into the banning of the app? Frankly speaking, um, there's also a ton yeah. of money to be lost and made. Um, it, it, it's it's not just agencies like us. Um, there, there, there's a lot of I think it was um, I believe it was L'Oreal um, that I was looking up and uh, some case studies that they've done with some influencer campaigns that they've done um, and how literally micro influencers and stuff like that have changed the game for some of the stuff that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People are making some serious money off of this platform. Um, so uh, th th those are some of my initial thoughts. What you thinking? Yeah, you hit on some really good points. The monetary aspect is definitely huge because it is a huge misbelief that a lot of the TikTok user base don't have purchasing power. And that's honestly not very true. You would be surprised that, you know, how much decision making purchasing power the audience and the um, users on TikTok actually have. Um, but what's interesting to me about TikTok is, you know, kind of piggybacking off you on the band, it's and it's honestly interest for me as a marketer, interesting to watch because at the end of the day, really, when you think about it, no matter what happens to TikTok, let's say it's here to stay, let's say it does get banned. The one thing that will stay true and true till the end is the attention will shift and there will be a new supply, no matter where it is. It may be something existing. It may be Facebook, maybe Instagram, it may be something completely new. No matter the way you think about it, something will change to where the attention and supply is still there. And the biggest indicator or why I believe TikTok is something here that is really to stay is what I like to call the tick TikTokification of the algorithms. And what I mean by that is back when, you know, math arbitrage, so to say, when we people used to just be good at numbers, good at data, good at analyzing, which, you know, Facebook and Instagram and these platforms made very easy for a lot of us is you just needed to be somebody who was keeping track of budgets, being efficient with it, optimizing, but the creative aspect wasn't as strong of a focal point. Was there still certain people that were probably doing even a good job back in that time? Sure, you know, there are many creative people, but what I think TikTok has really allowed is for true value-based content to take over. And not only on TikTok, all of the platforms have seen it, they see how attention gets diverted to it, um, and they started to change their algorithms That's as a good well. Point. Facebook Reels, for example, yeah, Facebook Reels, for example, huge, huge, huge opportunity if you're not your business or brand is not leveraging it. Um, so I think more than anything, even if the ban is looming, even if it's not, I would tell people because I know a lot of them are worried. It's if you were somebody who had the potential to really use TikTok and blow up, so to say, become popular, start to become an influencer if that's what your ambition is. The thing I tell would tell you is the opportunity is still there. Pay attention to kind of what's happening to the landscape. And for the sake of it, utilize TikTok while it's still around, right? I feel a lot of people are like pushing themselves and using the band as an excuse of like, hey, I should, I should just stay away from TikTok. When in reality, the exposure is still there. The supply and demand is still there. Use it while you can. Um, that way you will have some sort of, following that you can move over to wherever the next gonna say, whatever the platform may be so here's a here's another seamless thing that you can start to do right now if you're really concerned about it but you do have a following repurposing those same tiktoks that you're creating for youtube shorts and i know that's not what we're talking about right now but youtube shorts is another super underutilized social platform right now so if you are really concerned about it, like you were mentioning, continue to push the TikTok, continue to grow your following, continue to do that. But it's nothing to repurpose those same TikToks right now into YouTube shorts mm -hmm. and things like that. So if something was to happen, you can you already have your base over there. You can seamlessly move it over and different things like that. So that's just another thing for people who are very concerned about it. Go ahead and launch a YouTube shorts campaign. Go ahead and start to build up, put that type of stuff right there. You don't got to create new content. That's the beauty in it.
hundred percent. And people, I guess, tend to forget that YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So you really are 100%. good at creating the titles when it comes to your content. You have the opportunity for that thing to go viral, even three years down the road, to be honest with you. So a um, lot of opportunity with the upcoming TikTok ban. That is something that, you know, we'll probably continue to talk about and kind of keep on the, um, you know, I would say on the agenda as far as what we're looking at here as an agency. Um, but uh, down in. Okay, awesome. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Audio cut off for just a tad. Yeah. You're good now. You're good now. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. All right, let's go on to the next thing. What I want to talk about, which is honestly huge, and I know everybody and their mom has probably been talking about it. But how can you not? Chat GPT, AI, Dolly, Mid Journey, Jasper, all of these amazing tools that many of you have probably heard about, and how they're taking over our lives, um, according to many people out there. Um, but um, I have some thoughts. I know you have some thoughts. Let's start very simply. Have you used any of these tools? Man, I've used all of them. We've been <laughs> we've been using all of them, man. We, uh, you know, for months now in, in the making, we've been using all of these different tools. I know you have personally. I know our company has and different things like that. You know, I saw a quote that I, I find some truth. In. I, I know that people can say that it's controversial and different things like that, but I think there's truth in it. And the quote was that, AI won't be taking over, but up or uh, so it's, I'm sorry, it's like for people who are um, fearing about their job and things like that. And that comment was uh, AI won't take your job, but a person using AI will. That's and a good one. what I find very valid about that isn't the negative piece that people hear about that. And it's, you know, people are like, it's not authentic. There are, there are going to be no more experts and all of these different types of things and stuff. It's not that. It's if you imagine the person who is an expert <laughs> already in the space, and then that person gets good at leveraging things like mid-journey, mm. chat GPT, all of those other different types of things. Uh, imagine the graphic designer that has that that's already also the next level at that skill already. And then he has the ability to take a chat GPT, a mid-journey integration, a stable diffusion, and take what he already does great and then start to use those things on top of his skill set. That's what excites me about it. Um, that, not this disingenuine, not this fake, not a lot of those different things. Um, it's truly game changing. Um, it's it's it, it really is truly game. It, it really is truly game changing for so many different things. And I think a lot of I don't think that people understand the depth of usage of tools mm -hmm. like ChatGPT. You know, okay. not even talking business, even personal. You know, the idea that when you and I went to Spain, uh, we had ChatGPT plan a uh, plan an agenda for us, a tour. <laughs> Literally, what Literally. should we see when we're there? We want to do non-touristy stuff. Okay, show me some of the non-touristy places. Okay, what should we eat while we're there? Oh, those are great options to eat. Where are the best places to do that? Uh, so I just think that there's even personal elements to tools like this that are going to make our lives easier. You know, uh, I was on a call today. I had a team member talk about they had uh, chat GPT-4 make their schedule. Wow. And she was like, I literally use it to make my schedule and I literally use it to move things around and I talk to it like that. So like the integration is not just from the basic help create captions and help create copy, a lot of those different mm -hmm. things that you hear people talk about when they have this kind of negative taste in their mouth. Uh, there are so many use cases for this different type of stuff, specifically in, in, in our personal lives, for example, that really, really, really excite me for what, this, what the next level of this stuff is really gonna start to be. Is it scary potentially? No, it, it really isn't. Um, is it making things move very quickly? Maybe a lot quicker than a lot of people are comfortable with moving that I can get down with. But um, I, I love it, man. I, I love it. I love the direction that we're heading. I'm somebody that's leaned into it 100%. Um, yeah, what, what, what you think about that? Well, you know, I, I agree very, very deeply with um, pretty much everything that you said. And what's fascinating to me is exactly, you know, the fact that people are scared of it. But I want to say you know, at least one thing to those that are afraid. And typically it would be some words of assurance. In this case, I'm going to say whether you use it or not, the machines taking over will happen eventually. And if that's really what you're worried about, I promise you that 
you're not thinking about the right thing because <laughs> at the end of the day, really, and I get it. Like, I really do understand a lot of people are worried about their jobs. They're worried about that AI is going to replace them. They're worried about that AI will become, you know, smarter than the human. And I, and I get those, all of those concerns, but instead of you being the person that is fearful, I look at AI as enhancing and embracing. It, it yep. will enhance the proper humans that understand it and the yep. ones that embrace it. And if you're somebody who is going to be open to embracing AI, well, I promise you, then you're not the one that has to be concerned about mm -hmm. losing your job. I mean, in reality, the most important thing that AI is going to expose is what human beings were really known to do which is critical thinking. AI cannot critical think. God knows when it will be able to. Sure, it will be maybe in the future, but it can't do that. It needs a human being still to this day to give it that critical feedback, to give it that proper prompt, to give it that proper information and context for it to be valuable to yep. the user. Up to the point to where I know a lot of, at least maybe a lot of bigger companies, but even here at Socially and what we're thinking of is, a prompt engineering team. So it's really, whether it's, you know, somebody who majored in English, somebody who just has understanding of the technical side of it, that knows how to speak to it, whatever it may be, there's going to be people who can actually have good dialogue, good conversation, and be able to give it an input to where it honestly is making their life um, professionally and personally a lot more easier so for those that are scared i always tell them it's like you're really worried about the wrong king thing you need to be worried about how you can embrace it how you can um and how it can enhance your life um, and i think a lot of people are just worried about it taking over their jobs like i said which is true but there's many things in the history of life that took over people's jobs cars the iphone um social media and guess what happened those things came they're still here and life evolved. And I'm going to tell you the exact same thing will happen with AI. 100%. It, it's yeah. funny, I will say, um, so as you know, we're, this is something we're always researching. I mean, we're putting hours and hours into researching what's new, trying different things. You know, we have a couple Slack channels where we're always sharing ideas. Of, you know, we have yeah. the tools at AI Tools Slack and AI Prompts Chat. Drop some that you've learned, some tools. Um, one that was dropped today that's super interesting, that's based upon what you just said is, uh, someone dropped a pretty extensive prompt for mm -hmm. Chat GPT four of actually having Chat GPT four be its own prompt engineer. That's awesome. That's <laughs> actually pretty good. That one I'm a fascinated so, to see too because yeah, I haven't tried it yet, and it's pretty extensive. It, it's a pretty yeah. complex one. Um, and it's it, it's and this is again, you talk about people who don't really know how to use it to its best of its ability. You know, in this prompt, it talks about how. There's going to be iterations of this. So even after you spit out something, we are going to have to continue a dialogue in the conversation. Um, that's effective prompt engineering in itself, number one, just to begin with. So again, like you said, there will still be a necessity, a human element necessity and a, a creative, a smart, a, 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 a savvy digital element to it. Because again, even in this situation, if you copy just the first prompt, put it in and think that you got it, you still miss the ball. You still miss using it to its full capability, having this continued dialogue to get it to spit out the results that you're looking for and then optimize and then optimize. That's effective prompt engineering in itself. It still won't do that part. I agree 100%. If I can give anyone before we hop over to the next topic, one last piece of advice around AI, it's take the 30, 40, 50 hours of research, take that step, step, take that leap, don't be afraid, and just educate yourself. Even if you end up not wanting to use it, you can still have your mind closed and be like, I'm never going to use it. It doesn't, it's not for me. But at least take the time to educate yourself around it and see if that changes your mind. Cool. Cool. Love it. All right. So let's um, get into really get the last one or two segments here for today's episode. Um, I want to start off by something that I know is probably very important for a lot of business owners, for a lot of leaders out there. But 2023 has been, and even you know, towards the tail end of 2022, it was a weird time and um, error, so to say, for culture and layoff um, in today's you know day in society, and even here at Social In, you know, we've had to go through our own ups and downs, our own struggles, and our own um, you know accomplishments. But no matter how great of an organization it is, nobody is 
um, you know, safe, so to say, from mm -hmm. what happens in the real life world, right? In the economy, in the market, with everything that's going on. At some point, everything is going to catch up. And I don't want that to be a scary topic of conversation for a lot of people out there. So I wanted to talk about, you know, what are your thoughts or what are your words of advice, so to say, for people that may be in a bad position where, you know, they're having to be more thoughtful about spending money. They may have to let people go. You know, these are people's livelihood and it's not an easy decision at the end of the day. But what would you say to those people that are really worried about, you know, work culture and layoffs and the way that it affects the environment? So I have a few thoughts on this. Um, my first one is that I won't say that we accurately predicted some of these larger layoffs and things like this, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think to back when, uh, you know, we're a part of an agency group, uh, uh, TAN, um, and when we were in Switzerland last April, or I'm sorry, last February, whenever it was last year, one of the things that we were struggling with as an agency and other people were struggling with is, this increase in large ass from new when you're trying to hire people would just have crazy costs and crazy ass for the same positions that we were traditionally used to hiring for more mm -hmm. market what we thought were market appropriate type ass and the reason was because we all of a sudden had to compete with these very large companies we had to compete with right. the netflix the, the the googles all of these people who were paying our types of employees mm -hmm. salaries and things that we just couldn't compete with so we had to do things like over hire and or overpay for certain positions, things like that, just to get the same level of talent. I mean, we still had a white glove, world class service that we had to provide for our clients. We couldn't afford necessarily not to, but we were right. stuck in a very awkward position ourselves of what do we do? We can't continue to do this type of stuff as we're growing. We're still a small business and we're doing that type of stuff. Um, but one of the things that we also talked about at that meeting last time in Switzerland was again about are they going to be able to keep those? You know, if you are truly a 23, 24 year old individual who just got paid two, three times what the market said your job was worth, what would happen in two years? Could you, you know, and I'm just the question of, could you continue to provide enough value for that different type mm -hmm. of stuff? Would there actually be a market correction? And a lot of people did predict that there would be a market correction. So I know that stuff is unfortunate, but you know, a couple of years later, now that we're seeing all of these math layoffs and different things like that, I think Accenture just laid off another 19,000 people the other day and different things like that. Um, some of this was the result of, uh, of their own doing and things from a company sure. perspective. And again, the part that sucks about all of this is that people suffer. People mm -hmm. are the end of the day that pay for this type of stuff. Um, and that's what sucks. I have some friends literally um, who said that this is one of the hardest job markets uh, that they've ever been a part of between... Wow. Uh, having interviews that employees all of a sudden or employers all of a sudden are just not hiring for anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, undervalued work, you know, that is something that was a real, real thing. A lot of people were being undervalued, uh, getting offered salaries and things like that that were just significantly under what the market should have been and what the market price was. And a lot of people are really feeling that type of stuff. So um, I agree. A, a, few, a few things that I, as far as, I don't know if it's advice, but mm -hmm. the first thing is, there's not a better time to invest in yourself. Um, if there's one thing that we've learned about this is that corporations are gonna do what corporations do, unfortunately. Sometimes they can control it. Sometimes it is out of their control. Sometimes mm -hmm. revenue happens, large clients are lost and things like that. And tough, very, very tough decisions have to be made. Um, it's not always predictable, unfortunately. It's not always about you know the, the cash revenue or the, the cash that you have in reserves to do all those different types of things. So. First thing I will say is this is a good time to invest in yourself, invest in those skill sets that are, again, um, can quote unquote stand the test of time um, and investing in skills and different things like you that maybe there are other things that you can do to start to develop and um, uh, build a brand around yourself, build side hustle, side businesses, you know, the the the, the world of stock of of side gigs and things like that. Again, a lot of people may not see it being ideal and different things mm -hmm. like that, but there's no better time than the time right now to truly start to invest in your own hobbies, things that you're passionate about, things that you've really wanted to say, if I could do something for 40 hours a week that I love and things like that, though this is a really great time to really start to secure skills like that and invest in time to develop those type of things. What do you think? 
I agree. And I love that. In, um, and I'm sure many people will also take those um, words of advice. Um, but I, you know, I'm a huge believer. I definitely think you should be investing in yourself. I definitely think you should be learning new skills. I definitely think you should embrace AI and just, uh, um, like I said, be more thoughtful and educate yourself around, you know, what's happening. But I also think it's a very good time speaking of, you know, education and being thoughtful for business owners and leaders to also be exactly that a business owner. It's, fun to be a business owner in a time of yeah. growth in a time of up and to the right in the economy when there's so much abundance that sometimes you tend to forget that being a good business owner also means making good decisions for the organization going back to you know like you said for a century you know we've also had our own um, hurdles when it's come to this but you have to manage your business appropriately you have to have like the simplest rule that they say more revenue than expenses you got to manage your profit margins you got to manage your expectations and i've heard a funny um number and it may not be funny it may be actually honest but heard a fact the other day from somebody where they were like in most organizations um it's the 80 20 rule and it's you know uh, i think it's a 20 80 rule sorry not the 80 20 20 80 rule where 20% of your employees are actually doing 80% of the work in the organization. So this is a time for you to be thoughtful about that. Pay the people that are really making an impact in your organization. Take care of them. Be thoughtful about those individuals. Is firing going to be easy? No. Take it from a person now who's had to let many people go in his you know, 12, 13 years of running businesses. But it never gets any easier. There's never going to be a time where you're like, hey, I fired so many people. It's just easy to fire people now. That's not a thing. Um, so I think rather than people being afraid, because it does suck, you will have some tough conversations, you will have some hard times. I think what people really need to do is be smart, be thoughtful, have transparent conversations, and make sure those that you really, really want to keep in your organization that you're having open conversations with them about their future and where they can make an impact and the roles that they play when it comes to your organization. 100%, man. And again, it is unfortunate. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's, a, it's a rough market out there. So um, I look forward to seeing what we can do to, to, to not only um, hire appropriately, you know, pay. Uh, what we like to actually look at is we want to be able to pay above salary, you know, something that you, um, you, me and Keith, our CEO actually talked about, you know, we want to yeah. be known from the market for not just paying above, but actually retaining. Because again, that's again, what a lot of the, uh, when you talk about being uh, fiduciaries and fiscally responsible, a lot of people overcompensated for some things. And then all of a sudden, six months later, had to pull back in those things. So if we're going to do that stuff, how do you do it um, in a way that there's longevity to it, that it's not I just agree. a ploy, it's not just a play, that it allows the rest of your business to continue to grow and accelerate as well? I agree. Well, I think that will conclude um, for us today. You know, I really want to thank everybody, you know, tuning in. Um, Seriously Social, you know, we're here. We have a few jam-packed episodes coming up where I want to dig deeper into, you know, the chat GPT and AI. I want to start to think more about where social media, specifically for businesses and brands are heading mm -hmm. in 2023, because there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, but to close the remarks, we appreciate everybody for watching. Um, thank you, Lorenzo, again. Um, and, you know, we're going to look forward to the next episode. And, you know, Koshal here, Lorenzo here, and I'm signing out. Yeah, man, we'll be back in touch. And, uh, hey, appreciate everybody's time. Brother, it's always good to chat with you for a few. Likewise. Yes, sir.